Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Executive Editor for Data Diversity. We would like to thank you for joining this month's installment of the monthly DEMA International Webinar Series. This webinar series is designed to give our Enterprise Data World Conference attendees education year-round, and we are actually presenting live from Enterprise Data World 2016, uh, having a great event so far. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we've been collecting them by the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share how it's a questions via Twitter using hashtag DEMA. If you would like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the top right for that feature. As always, you will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me formally introduce today's speaker, Glenn Bell. Glenn is the Director at Visual Explanations. He has worked in data management for almost 30 years. He is the President of DEMA in Australia and delivers training in CDMP and data modeling. He is an independent consultant and has worked for a variety of organizations in Canada, Europe, Malaysia, Singapore, New Zealand, and throughout Australia. He holds a Master of Business Information Technology Management from the University of Technology, Sydney, and a Bachelor of Science Computing and Mathematics from the University of Queensland. He also has a CDMP and CBIP certifications, both at mastery level. Fantastic. And with that, I will turn the presentation over to Glenn to get us started. Hello and welcome. Thank you, Shannon. So today we're going to be um, drawing on my experiences with a federal government client in Australia where they needed to um, integrate data from different sources and needed to do that in very controlled fashion. So there are, I, I have a series of slides that I'll be working through. The first seven slides will set the context and the drivers and the reasons why we have to be so careful when consolidating data. And, then slide number eight is actually my favorite slide. It's got a knockout diagram that I'm sure you will all love, and that's the one where we will uh, really focus a fair bit of attention. So if you get a little bit bored or that during the slides up to number seven, don't, don't leave. It will get very, very exciting on slide number eight. So the dangers of consolidating data um, is that if um, a citizen um, we consolidate data from their education, from their employment, maybe some health records, and that becomes very powerful and could be misused and represents reputational risk for the agency that's consolidating the data and a breach of privacy for the um, citizen that's involved. So you might say, well, if there are these dangers involved, why consolidate data at all? Um, keep away from the danger and just don't do it. However, for government to be able to um, ensure that it is um, producing the outcomes for citizens that it wants to achieve, frequently it needs to be able to get uh, data that's located in more than one government agency. Uh, if you could imagine, uh, uh, as a hypothetical example, um, a person, a citizen with disabilities, and the government puts in a program to provide supports for that person, and they want to do that so that they get improved outcomes for that citizen in terms of their improved employment, um, improved educational out outcomes, um, if possible, better health outcomes, and just general um, increase in integration with the community. No one agency has that data, so to be able to measure the efficiency and the effectiveness of that policy, you need to consolidate the data and that then allows us to make policy decisions that are informed and make the best use of public money. So we're really needing to engage in this dangerous activity of consolidating data from different sources to be able to ensure that we are getting the best outcomes for citizens in a cost-effective manner. And what I'm going to explore in this presentation is how to manage the dangers that are involved, the risks that are involved. So the Australian government um, has recognised, as has many governments around the world, um, these dangers and the fact that they still need to embark on this activity. And so within Australia, they have established what's called the Integration Authority Accreditation. This is not law. There is no Act of Parliament. What has occurred is that the heads of government departments, in Australia known as secretaries, 
uh, for the major um, government departments have come together in, in, a, in a committee, um, recognised that they need to consolidate data, but um, acknowledged the dangers and then developed the accreditation program to give comfort to those who are leading their agencies that all the controls are in place when consolidating data to protect citizen privacy. So um, I'm going to be stepping you through an example of a um, integration authority accreditation application submission. Uh, and in essence, um, key elements include having people who are doing the consolidating work performing different roles, and those roles then give you different access to the data at various stages along the integration path. I'll also, um, um, the implementation of this can be done in either a cheap and manual way, and my experience with um, this government agency was the cheap and manual approach. So we would have paper-based logs with um, managers um, physically sitting in the room when people were performing various roles and ensuring as a check that nothing wrong, bad happened. Um, however, you can also go down the expensive and automated route. So more mature agencies uh, use um, automated monitoring and logging of what is occurring during the um, um, integration process and sophisticated mechanisms for controlling the access for people's roles based on using virtual machines and um, more advanced concepts like that. So when I step you through the fantastic diagram that will be appearing on page on slide nine, eight, um, it's technology independent, but you can do it at different levels of expense. So we've discussed the dangers that are involved, but the need to still consolidate um, data. And so how do you go about it? Well, essentially there's a whole set of policies and procedures that surround the consolidating of data if you were to get the integration accreditation to give comfort to, you, to this agency that things are being done properly and audible, audibility. Um, there will be different roles for loading, separating, linking, and analyzing the data. And my diagram on, page, on slide eight will highlight that. There's also costs that are involved. There's um, increased audit resources, both internal and external, for ensuring that data is secure and the um, policies are being followed. And even in the cheap and cheerful approach, you still have to do work around software. Uh, in the example that I participated in, uh, rather than a virtual machine, they did uh, folder level locking to be able to control who could write and who could read to a particular folder. But that still requires effort to do that. So I suppose the tension that comes in is that the easiest thing in the world is if an agency wanted to consolidate data, is they just get some extracts from their other government agencies and they give it to a person and they just work with it and put it all together. But unfortunately, that would expose all sorts of dangers if that person went rogue. And I might just, as an aside, um, talk about how important these controls are with a example in the Australian marketplace, the Australian government. Uh, this is a publicly available example. It's been in the newspapers, so I'm not um, giving away any secrets. Um, the Australian Bureau of Statistics, which is probably the most sophisticated gold standard for integrating data, has very strict controls and procedures and culture around protecting data. Unfortunately, one person went rogue and they were involved in releasing quarterly economic data. And they had gone to a university with a friend who wound up working for one of Australia's major banks, the National Australia Bank. And prior to the quarterly results being released, this person would SMS the, uh, the figures down to his trader friend at NAB. And then this trader would take advantage of that and put in trades that would make lots of money. Now, the National Australia Bank's risk um, controls quickly highlighted that this particular person was off the scale and alerted the Australian Federal Police um, and the Australian Bureau of Statistics to this. And it didn't take too long for them to figure out what happened to, in this scenario. Um, both of the individuals that were involved 
have gone to jail for years. Um, the longer term is for the National Australia Bank person who was also um, found guilty of um, bribing a public officer. And for me, one of the more important things is that the Australian Federal Police also reviewed what the ABS had done in terms of their procedures and controls, and they were found to be fine. What I mean to say is that there was no systemic risk. There were all the controls that you could possibly want to have in place were in place, and all the culture and training and everything around it. Um, but we had a person who went rogue, possibly a mental health issue. Um, but for the Australian community, they could take satisfaction that, okay, if something bad happens, then the individuals are penalised and jailed for a significant period of time, and that the controls are in place to be able to ensure that this is not a systemic problem and that it should never happen again. And the sorts of things that I'm going to be showing you on the infamous slide eight, uh, look at how you can ensure that um, the systems are in place to prevent as far as humanly possible a breach occurring. So the integration authority um, procedures um, come in when there's at least two data sets. Well, fair enough. Um, can't consolidate one data set with itself. Um, it's for statistical research purposes. So there are other powers that control consolidating data for investigating fraud or other operational matters. It's where the data um, is subject to the Privacy Act, so it's personal information, um, potential to compromise Commonwealth outcomes, and it occurs at a unit record level. So it's where it's individual people data that's happening. On to slide seven. One more to go before slide eight. And the Integration Authority has a set of criteria to evaluate the suitability of the agency's um, controls um, to see if they were worthy of the integration accreditation. So criteria one, which is um, really super important, is the ability to ensure secure data management. So linkage is not performed directly, that is that it's not just one person who's in control of these files and consolidating, but it's separated out. And that the data separation principle is being adhered to, and I'll talk about that in the next slide, and that when you finally get to the point where you do the analysis, the analysis files do not contain identifying data, such as name, date of birth, address, or the identifier from the original data set. So um, you will now see the much heralded slide eight, which gives you the end-to-end -end process for being able to control the um, 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 the consolidation process. So you will see that there are three large boxes, um, the shaded boxes that form the, break, the background, and they are labeled the librarian, the linker, and the analytic. Um, these are the roles that are performed, and a person, uh, they could be different people doing these roles, or if it's the same person, they can only be in the role at one point in time. Um, so, the, uh, so we'll start off with the librarian role. Uh, actually, no, I'll tell you what, I'll just give you a brief overview and then I will drill down, as John Zuckman would say, in excruciating levels of detail to make sure everything's perfectly clear. So the librarian is the one who receives the data set um, that needs to be consolidated, the data sets, and they will then put that data set through an extract and standardization process and they will then separate the data into the analysis data. So you'll see the analysis file one on the right-hand side and the match file data, the data that will be used to match the um, individuals involved. The match file data, so I'm now looking at the linker box, uh, helps to link the data together, enables the linking of the data to a link file and then eventually the two analysis files in the analytic box get matched and you get a consolidated analysis file that has um, no identifying information. So it is completely de-identified. So I'm just going to use my pinch feature on my Surface Pro 3 and I'm also checking on Shannon's screen and that looks like it's 
yes, you can view what's going on here. So let's look at the initial steps that impact on the librarian. So the librarian receives the original data set, but before they can do that, um, there's a set of approvals that need to occur. So the external agency that is providing the data set needs to approve, but also the request from the agency doing the consolidation needs to go through a set of approvals as well to ensure that the, um, um, usually, um, in the Commonwealth Government, we call it the senior executive service level, the, um, the uh, leaders of the organisation, uh, understand that this linkage is going to occur and approve receiving the data from the other external agency. So there is full visibility that this is happening. Um, and, and I would also have, as a data management person, also have the involvement of the data management committee or data management board or whatever the governance structure that is in place to also provide that SES officer with the guidance that yes, this is required, um, this consolidation work is required. The trigger for this consolidation work may have been some analysis of the performance of the organisation or in government, it could be something such as a um, ministerial question. Step number two, so before we even get started with the library and the original data set number one, step number two is to ensure that all the people who are involved in this project whatever the role they're doing, librarian, linker or analytic, that they have no conflicts of interest. So um, in, in my scenario, we developed a no conflicts of interest form and the person had to sign that um, and um, we would then scan that and store it in the document management system. Um, and that form also made people aware that under the act that guided this agency, that if you uh, were to compromise data, the uh, penalty was two years in jail. So people are very clear that this is a serious business and um, um, you will be prosecuted if you misuse this information. Step number three before this project begins under the um, integration accreditation by the Australian Government is to inform the community and um, the National Statistical Service, NSS, set up a website, you can go to it on nss.gov.au and any integration projects that are happening by any accredited agency are listed there so that there is transparency to the community that this is occurring. So the next step then finally is to receive the data set but obviously this can't be sent as an attachment to an email. Uh, we used a secure FTP product um, to be able to ensure that the data was encrypted um, even though we were behind government firewalls to just make absolutely sure that there could be no tampering with the data. Okay, we're now back to our diagram and we're looking at the librarian's role. So you will see the original data set has the record ID number one, uh, record ID. That's the record ID for this data set as held by the original agency, the agency that provided this data. So that has to be stripped out before we can let it go through to the analysis stage because if you got a hold of that record ID and you were looking at consolidated data, you could go back to the original data set and you would know who the person was. There will be um, the other things that are in the original data set are the data linkage items. So they're the things that are used to um, try to determine if two people are the same person. In our example, we used what are known as statistical linkage keys, an SLK, which takes various characters out your first name and surname and your date of birth. Um, and it's a pretty good guide. It's not perfect, nothing's perfect when you're trying to match data, but it's a fairly good guide for being able to see that two people are the same person. So we need those data linkage items. If you're interested in statistical linkage keys, there's an excellent ex explanation on Wikipedia. Um, so that gets extracted into an, a landing area. You'll see the blue box. It gets standardized, and by that I mean things like Rob, Robert, Robbie, and Bob all get standardized to some standard name to help give the statistical linkage key its best chance of matching people. Also things like sex for male, female, maybe in the source system it was called one, two, 
So you would have some translation standardization to be able to um, put it into a standard form to again help with the um, matching of the people. And then the third step that occurs by the librarian is to separate the data. And you will see that they separate data that goes into the linker area. I'm just moving my finger along and looking at Shannon's thing, yes. So you see match file number one. Oh, sorry, I should have said back at the librarian, source file, source file number one over here. Yes, you can see my mouse. Um, so we put in a project ID so that we've replaced the um, original identifier with a identifier that we've created uniquely for this project. The data linkage items, linkage check items, are things such as country of origin or other things that could help um, with the matching, um, but aren't necessarily part of a um, SLK, a statistical linkage key. Demographic items are the things that we want to an analyze, which might be things about you know where this person lives, or could be things about their salary or whatever, whatever democratic, uh, democratic, dem demographic items, not democratic, and some other analysis items. Now in the match file, so this is this part here. So when the person performing the role of the librarian separates the data and creates the match file, in our example, we used folder level locking. So that librarian could only write to the match file, but they could not read the match file, uh, read anything that's in that folder where that match file goes into. So um, only the person performing the role of linker, that is that they'd signed on to the system with various user IDs and password that gave them the authority to go into the linker folder, could see the match file number one and more importantly, the link file that gets created. And I'll just show you the other thing that comes out of the separate is that we go over to the analytic um, area and you'll see analysis file number one, which is where the, uh, which just has the demographic items, the analysis items. So the match file has stuff that's for, for matching and the analysis file has stuff for um, performing analysis, demographic, analytical type items. Again, that analysis file, the person who is the librarian can only, rink, can only write to that folder, that's the analytic folder, uh, but they can't read from it. Because if they could, they'd be able to see the consolidated analysis file, which you'll see down here, and that would then compromise things because they've got, the librarian has access to the original file. So, Match file, so we've got the analysis person. So match file number one has been created. It's got a project ID, it's got data linkage items, it's got linkage check items uh, to help try to link people together. Then we receive a second data set and the librarian follows the same process of extracting, standardizing, getting rid of the record identifier, putting in a project identifier, this is project ID number two, uh, linkage items and demographic items, and they do the same thing. They separate the data into data that will be used for matching and for um, analysis. So you can see that they've got, we've got a match file here, and then over on the purple bit, a, um, over down here, we've got a um, demographic items. All right, so then the person who is performing the role of the linker comes in, they access their folder, they've been provided with match file one and match file two. They don't know who these people, um, well, they don't know any demographic sort of information or analysis information about these people. They only have the information that would be used for linking people, for identifying who's who. And so they run the link process, generating statistical linkage keys and map mapping people up and create what's called the link file. So now we have project ID number one, project ID number two, and we created a link ID, but we're saying we've allocated a, a random number to this person here and a random number to this person over here from two different data sets. They're the same person and they're linked together. That then takes us through to the analysis portion. So the person doing the linker role can then write that, uh, that link file into the analytics section but they can't read anything in the analytics section. The person who is then doing the analytic part 
then runs a match program based on the link file to match the demographic stuff to produce a consolidated analysis file that is de-identified but has rich information about people, but it is confidential, well, it hasn't yet been confidentialized, but it is de-identified. That's the thrust of what I'm talking about, but I will just, um, and I'm expecting a few questions around slide number eight, but I'll just finish off the slide presentation um, and then open it up for questions. Shannon, are we getting a few questions through? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. All right. Okay. So, page down. All right. So, uh, Criterion 1 also goes on to um, uh, having audit programs in to ensure that data security is, is being uh, performed, that the um, people who are performing the roles of the of the librarian, the linker, and the analytics have um, been subjected to police checks, that the physical security on the premises where this data is being held um, is in place. So um, with um, key cards and uh, those sorts of mechanisms. So it's not much good having all these um, sign in, sign out, and all that sort of stuff if somebody could just come in and steal the computer that the data is, is on. Um, that the internet gateway security, is this data accessible from the internet? If so, what sort of securities are in place? And the, that there's an information security policy in place um, in the Australian Federal Government, it's called the Information Security Manual, the ISM. And then there were a set of other criteria um, about um, controls over external data access. So if you were to publish this uh, data, uh, not only does it need to be de-identified, which is the natural process of, the, um, of this activity, but it also needs to be confidentialized, which means that even though we don't know who it is, if the data related to a small country town and the person earned a million dollars a year and they had HIV AIDS, then people in that community could pretty much work out who it is. So there's a, a process that statisticians use to perturb the data to avoid that from happening. Criteria number three, um, availability of appropriate skills so the people who are doing this work need to um, um, have the experience and the expertise to do that. Criteria four is about the technical capability so that there is the software and hardware and other things in place to make it um, happen. Number five is a lack of conflict of interest and again the reforms that people would fill in. Number six, that the culture and values, so uh, when you were onboarded, that there was training in place, and that there were records that you'd been through the training, um, uh, and other evidence that there was culture and values about confidentializing and protecting information. Criterion seven is transparency of operations, which were things like publishing this, um, the, the details about this project, this um, integration project on the internet and the existence of, ex of appropriate governance and institutional frameworks. Um, in our example, not surprisingly, we would have um, data management committees and our, we would follow as our institutional framework the dm Bock wheel. Um, oh, and um, that was it. And I'm at 11.27. So that was the, so that was the, um, the essence of the presentation. It is about um, managing the dangers about data being consolidating, making sure that there are controls in place to protect that data, and I wanted to give you a specific example about how you could go about doing that. Sure, and we have um, questions coming in already, uh, certainly about slide number, the infamous slide number eight. Yes, <laughs> okay, um, I expected that to happen. <laughs> so just a reminder to everyone, um, before we get started on those questions, I will be sending a follow-up email within two business days with links to the slides, um, so you can have a copy of slide number eight and uh, as well as a recording of the webinar. So um, one questioner has three related questions. Let me read all three yeah. of them at once, and then we can kind of parse it out a little bit here. Um, uh, so you show uh, flowing in one direction, left to right. Yeah. Um, do you also implement a right to left process so that an authorized person can go back up the mm -hmm. flow to see where errors may occur? And I can read it again, too. No, no, I, I understand. Yeah. The, di the diagram implies a large number. Yeah. Uh, uh, the second question is the diagram implies a large number of changes to data during the workflow. Mm -hmm. Do you attach metadata to data um, to document the, the 
province of the, to of the data. They, the thought being that some chain of custody of data needs to be documented in some manner. You mentioned that. And then the third part of that question is you mentioned the folder level is locking. Yeah. Uh, is metadata attached to the folder? Is that the lowest level of tracking that your, that, um, your control process implements? Yeah, 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 okay, great questions. All right, so yes, you're right. So the diagram goes um, left to right, and um, the questioner has pointed out, well, what if you get to the analysis stage and clearly um, something is wrong? So we looked, so there are trade-offs, aren't there? So we did consider that as things move from the librarian to the linker, that we would delete the intermediary files and similarly, when it went from the linker to the analytic stage, that we would delete those files. But as the questioner has pointed out, if something is found to be wrong at the analysis stage, then you would have to recreate the whole process um, again. So our procedures were to uh, leave as a final step to delete the files. So the files are protected, if you like, because of the folder level security. But um, still and all, at the end of the project, those intermediary files need to be deleted. Otherwise, if they're just sitting there hanging around, um, they're, they're vulnerable and um, a breach could occur. Um, so I hope I've answered that question sufficiently. Um, the next question was about changes to the data. So we don't actually change any of the information about the person in terms of their demographics and that. We do generate an SL key, SLK, uh, statistical linkage key. Um, this is all done as part of one project. So you sort of run it through. We have, um, we have metadata in the, in the sense that we have a paper form that is filled in by each person as they do each step. Um, as well as the signature of the manager who is watching each of these people doing these steps and the start time and the end time um, and signatures as, as declarations that this is what occurred. So that was our sort of cheap manual approach, if you like. Obviously, you can do something much more sophisticated with monitoring and logging and keeping um, uh, data lineage um, um, metadata in place. But we did it as a paper-based form that went step one, step two, step three, with signatures and dates and times. Yeah, it's still metadata, it's just on a piece of paper. Um, and the third question was about folder level. Um, was that our main security mechanism? And the answer is yes. However, I would emphasize that the, this space that this work is carried out on is only accessible to the three roles here, the librarian, the linker, and the analytics person. So they're the only people who can get to that disk space. And then at a folder level, um, the librarian could only, could write to that, read and write to their space, but they could only write to the linker and write to the analytic area. And similarly, the linker could read their, their, their linker folder, but only write to the analytic. Um, and then the analytic person could only read in the analytic folder. So. Um, um, obviously, you can spend more money. You can do sophisticated things, which other agencies do around the area of virtual machines and that. But um, you know, we've been in this project. We were in this, setting this up. We were subjected to external audits, and we were deemed to be satisfactory. So, um, what's my answer to that question? Fabulous. Um, you know, metadata has become such a hot topic. Mm -hmm. um, it, we get questions in every webinar, no matter what the topic is, yes. related to metadata. Um, anything you want to expand on that, on just the importance of it, and, and, and any additional areas it's, that played a role in this project? It's, it's absolutely crucial to this type of work, um, because we're going to be subject to continual audits. We are undertaking activity that is very dangerous. We are consolidating data about citizens. And so we are continually subjected to audits. And the only way that the auditor can be satisfied is if we have the metadata in place to be able to support that, yes, we followed this process. We did what was here, and it's an approved process. Um, otherwise, otherwise, 
what have you got? You've got this process, you've got this lovely diagram, slide number eight, um, but if nobody's following it, then it's a complete farce. It's a waste of time. Sure. Um, everyone's pretty quiet today. No additional questions coming in. Any, anything else coming in for, uh, that you want to know? Just put it in the Q&A section. I'll just uh, hang out here for a couple of minutes. Of course, you know, a lot of our attendees are here at the uh, conference. Anything that you're excited about, Glenn, and seeing or you've learned so far at EDW? Uh, yeah, so there's been some, uh, well, as always, there's been uh, great, <laughs> great sessions um, happening at EDW. Um, I'm particularly interested in creating data models for NoSQL um, databases, and Dave Wells gave a great um, tutorial yesterday on that. Um, he had some very clear examples about the syntax that you would use for um, document data stores, and um, how that could be modeled using a particular modeling technique. And I found that really um, quite um, useful, yeah, as, especially as somebody who, um, I teach Graham Simpson's Data Modeling Essentials course in, in Australia, and um, um, people are increasingly in that course, um, has a very, is very rich and does a great job around the relational space, but I'm always keen to hear about um, extensions or ways that we can do stuff for NoSQL databases. So um, um, uh, I went, oh yes, that's, that's marvelous. Um, I also went to um, Donna Burbank's um, session um, on uh, setting up a data management um, practice, uh, and that was perfect for me just at this point in time because I'm currently at a different client setting up a data management practice. Uh, so I drew a lot of comfort from the fact that <laughs> I, <wasn't laughs> I was doing the sort of things that Donna was saying, but uh, I also like the fact that I can go back to Sydney, Australia and sit down with my client and step through some of the slides in particular that um, I thought were uh, pertinent to them and be able to say, well, look, we're in line with international best thinking. So. Yeah. Um, that sort of stuff is just just gold. I yeah. love it. Yeah, we do have a couple of questions coming in. Uh, more questions too on your topic. Um, uh, yeah, and, and I, we love Donna too. And uh, how long did it take to set up the library linker and analytic uh, LDCs? Look, to be honest, that was kind of the easier part of it. Mm -hmm. So when I get to, um, so I've just flicked to slide number nine with all these stuff about physical security and that. So I had to demonstrate to auditors that the physical security logs were all in place, which meant I had to talk to the property security people and I said I need a list of all the people who have access to this, to this area. And of course the property people are going, we're not giving you that. Like I need to be able to show the, the auditors that these, these are in place. So there were things that were um, very, time consuming, like the internet gateway security. I had to find out what that was and get the proper documentation to be able to support the auditors to say, yes, this is in place, or these, this particular disk space is not being, being accessed. Um, and, you know, I had to demonstrate that our people had the appropriate skills. So I had to get their resumes, put it, <laughs> put it into a format. So. I, the, the, the submission itself might have been 40 pages, but it then referred to all these other supporting documents. So I, I don't know why I'm using my hands here because people can't see, but I'm, I'm showing Shannon a, two hands that are about three feet, feet apart because I just had this wad of material to be able to substantiate that we had all the checks and controls uh, in place. Um, um, and that was, Took took time, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, is, is there uh, additional documentation available about the various criteria, for example, written policy and procedure documents? Uh, um, well, I do have those things, but they're sort of client specific, so I don't, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> no general. <laughs> I, 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 um, I've sort of generalized as much as I can here, but if you go to the um, nss.gov.au website, um, you'll see, um, um, you'll see, you can find submissions that have happened from other agencies um, uh, and uh, you can look at their submissions and you can look at the criteria that's used. However, 
they don't actually publish the exact policies and procedures that are used by these agencies. I suppose there is a bit of security stuff around this as well. Um, sure. Yeah. Uh, anything else you want to add? I, that's all the questions that we've got that have come in so far. And anything else you want to add before we end uh, the session? No, I think I've. Um, I, I think I performed excruciating detail on slide number eight. Um, <laughs> and um, look, even if um, you didn't grasp everything that was on slide number eight, I suppose my take-home message is to. It's firstly, if you're in the workplace and somebody says we need to consolidate data from um, different organisations, that you immediately raise the warning bell and say what are the privacy implications and what are our controls and procedures around that. And if you're getting hassled by a boss who says um, just do it, then perhaps you can take a copy of these slides and sit them down and show them slide number eight and show them the level of sophistication that's required if you're going to do this in a controlled manner that protects people's privacy. Um, and if I've achieved that in this webinar, then I'm really happy. I love it. Well, well you're certainly getting some accolades here. Well, I just want to thank you for this great presentation and Q&A. Uh, and thanks to our attendees, as always, for being engaged in everything that we do and asking such great questions. Uh, and we will sign off here from Enterprise Data World 2016, and we will see you next month uh, at the next webinar. I hope everyone has a great day. Cheers. Bye.